Can a plant-based diet reverse Alzheimer's disease? Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Westman and welcome to my channel where I review and debunk nutritional misinformation online. In this video, which is from Nutrition Facts and done by Michael, Dr. Grieger, Michael Grieger, who is a plant-based advocate, is going to be reviewing a paper about Alzheimer's and the plant-based diet. Now, anything that reduces insulin resistance should probably have some benefit because in my read of the literature, Alzheimer's is thought to be from insulin resistance. And insulin resistance though, which may have been going on for 20 years. So if in many situations, it may be too late to have benefit if you start getting clinical symptoms from Alzheimer's, but it would be really great if we had a treatment that helped for sure. Before we dive into today's video, I want to invite you to my free webinar, Beyond Cholesterol, the two biggest risk factors for cardiovascular disease. If you're confused by cholesterol or feeling pressured by your doctor to take cholesterol medication, this webinar is perfect for you. Discover the crucial facts about why cholesterol isn't the primary concern for cardiovascular disease risk and learn what you should focus on instead to evaluate and lower your risk. You can sign up below. Dr. Dean Ornish was the first to show in a randomized controlled trial that a plant-based diet and lifestyle program could apparently reverse the progression of our number one killer, heart disease, opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery. Well, so let me just comment on that. So Dr. Ornish, if you've been reading the, the pop culture books and has a certain brand that is a certain type of diet and approach and usually does a study or, or maybe two himself. And if you've been watching some of the videos I've done re recently, you want to be suspicious of studies funded by the, the person who's promoting the diet, right? If, if it's a company that's funding the study on Diet Coke, you want to make sure you're a little bit suspicious. Maybe, you know, be extra critical of the methodology, for example. So Dr. Ornish, years ago, I have to hand it to him for putting lifestyle on the map diet and exercise on the map as a legitimate medical treatment. Back then it was thought that diet didn't matter. Well, most doctors today don't even think diet matters. But so the, the problem with that study that he did years ago it, through today's lens is it's just not good enough methodology. And, and so you, it was overplayed, overgeneralized, over, over reported because back then there, there really wasn't much to go on. Now we know that that methodology was fairly weak because of the number of subjects and because of the, the using angiography. But be that as it may, if it really was the, the treatment that was found there, it would probably have been replicated, and replicated over and over and over. And by now, and after 30 years from that paper, we probably would all be reversing coronary atherosclerosis if that was really that powerful. Now, some argue that, you know, these studies aren't funded. Well, when we started our studies on low carb diets in the year 2000 or so, the first publication was 2002, the effect was so big that you could see it in, on obesity and diabetes that other people around the world started studying it. So low carb, low fat, low carb, low fat, low carb. And because the methods were fairly easy to implement, you cut down the carbs, people have benefits. You know, within 10 years, there were meta-analyses, meaning summaries of studies, studies of studies on randomized trials that low-carb diets beat out low-fat diets for the treatment of obesity, and a fewer number, but still studies that show that low-carb beats out other diets in the treatment of diabetes. Now, I'm not aware of any low-carb study versus a plant-based study that we're going to be talking about in this video, and, and so you want to be careful if you have a promoter to say this diet is best, well, you have to be sure that that diet has been tested against another effective diet, right? You might say this car is fastest, but if you haven't 
tested it against other cars or you test it against the, the slowest car there is, you don't really know that that's the fastest car. And so promoters of different diets often will overstate that it's the best based on what in you know, critical terms is maybe weak or preliminary science. Then he showed the same plant-based program could potentially reverse the course of early-stage prostate cancer. Dementia is the most feared condition of later life. There's a common misconception that we have no control over whether or not we develop dementia, but the good news is that although Alzheimer's may be incurable, at least it is preventable. This is what our cerebral arteries should look like— open, clean, allowing blood to flow throughout our brain. This is what atherosclerosis in our head looks like— clogged with cholesterol, closing off our arteries, clamping down on blood flow. What kind of brain arteries do you want in your head? After all, what is the Alzheimer's gene, APOE? It codes for the major cholesterol carrier inside the brain. This may explain the so-called Nigerian paradox, where they have among the highest rates of the Alzheimer's gene, but some of the lowest rates of Alzheimer's disease. How is that possible? Genes load the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. The paradox may be explained by their low cholesterol levels, probably due to their diets low in animal fat. So this is an interesting narrative that we've all been taught and told, and doctors still repeat it, that the, the cholesterol in the food and the fats in the food raise the cholesterol in the blood, and it's the cholesterol in the blood that causes the arterial cholesterol, the narrowing. I don't think it's such a strong narrative anymore. And, or another diplomatic way to say it is that there's another way to go about this. You can lower insulin resistance by many different methods. It, it, and insulin resistance, it turns out to be, if not as powerful as cholesterol, even more powerful than cholesterol as a paradigm to work on to reduce and atherosclerosis insulin resistance. And if insulin resistance is, and atherosclerosis is related to Alzheimer's disease, then the, the reducing insulin resistance by whatever diet you do, or drug, or, or, or surgery for that matter, whatever intervention, will reduce your insulin resistance and whatever outcome is from that. So this is not the only narrative or mechanistic explanation for this problem. In terms of dietary guidelines for the prevention of Alzheimer's, we should center our diets around vegetables, legumes, beans, flippies, chickpeas, and lentils, fruits, and whole grains. In other words, the dietary pillar of lifestyle medicine, whole food, plant-based nutrition. But prevention isn't sexy. When prevention works, nothing happens. But the same diet and lifestyle that helps prevent heart disease was proven to help reverse it. Until then, it was believed that heart disease progression could only be slowed, not stopped or reversed, similar to how Alzheimer's disease is viewed today. So what if you put people with Alzheimer's on the same plant-based program? You don't know until you put it to the test. And remember, if you've been watching some of my videos before on highly processed foods, sugar and ultra-processed foods, this kind of pro program will not allow you to have those foods, which the growing consensus is saying that these are the bad foods, the, the junk food, highly sugar and ultra processed foods. So I would assume that this approach will help compared to a typical diet. I don't know for sure, and we'll look at, at the detail, but again, it's not testing against other, what we think are healthier lifestyles than the typical American one, I'm afraid. A randomized, controlled, phase two clinical trial to see if the progression of Alzheimer's disease may be slowed, stopped, or perhaps even reversed by randomizing about 50 men and women diagnosed with early-stage Alzheimer's to either make no lifestyle changes for 20 weeks or to eat a whole food plant-based diet with supplements like vitamin B12, moderate exercise like walking a half an hour a day, stress management like relaxing with 
breathing exercises, and getting group support over Zoom. They measured standard tests of cognition and function before and after in each group, as well as objective experimental biomarkers of disease progression. On the clinical dementia rating global scale, which is used to stage the severity of dementia, the control group continued to get worse. But the diet and lifestyle group started to get better. People diagnosed with Alzheimer's getting better? The same seemed to happen when measured with the Alzheimer's disease assessment scale, though this did not reach statistical significance. And using what's called the clinical dementia rating sum of boxes scoring, both groups continued to deteriorate, but the decline was significantly less in the healthy living group. Overall, using what's called the Clinical Global Impression of Change scoring, most of the people in the control group kept getting worse, and none showed any improvement, which is what you'd expect with Alzheimer's, whereas about 40% of those in the diet and lifestyle group appeared to be getting better within five months of eating and living healthier. Now, why did some get better and others not? Well, the more they complied with the recommendations, the greater the beneficial impact on their cognition and function. This helps to explain why studies of less intensive lifestyle interventions were not sufficient to stop disease progression, let alone actually improve cognition and function. The biggest limitation of the study is that, you know, unlike drug trials, where you can give people a disguised placebo sugar pill, when a study involves major diet and lifestyle changes, you can't rule out the placebo effect, especially for self-reported subjective, how's your memory been type questions. That is the biggest limitation or critique of this, that the People who were randomized to getting the intervention had all the attention, they, they were given extra programs and, and different diet, and, and so it, it's hard to separate out just the fact that you were paying more attention to them with a totally subjective measure like he's talking about, which is, you know, how are you feeling? How's your, your, your memory function? In a 20-week trial, it, you know, that's a pretty substantial period of time. I, I think that is reasonable. Some studies are done over two weeks or four weeks, and they call it quits, and they say, look, everything's better. Now, that wouldn't be really fair for testing something for Alzheimer's, which is a very chronic kind of problem. But the other interesting thing is there were only 49 people in the study, which, you know, if you could show something that this, this good in that few people, this needs to be re replicated immediately. That someone needs to redo this, and, and it, yes, it needs to be replicated before you follow it. The hallmark of science is replication. And the, so the first thing Dr. Ornish should do is to get someone else, not him, to replicate the study. And, and however they funded it, they could fund or find another group to do it. And then why not use a different control group that has a different sort of diet that you might think is beneficial rather than the usual care, because that gets into the, you know, the brandedness of the program, uh, where here the brand is plant-based for whatever reason. The, a lot of it, I guess, is financial because of the industry coming out with plant-based things. But the main thing is that there was less progression or and even some minimal improvement, which is a significant finding over 20 weeks. But the researchers also measured objective investigational biomarkers of disease progression and saw the same trajectory, improvements in the interventional group and worsening in the control group, with the same apparent dose-response effect, meaning the more they improve their diet and lifestyle, the more dramatic the effect. Compare that to the latest Alzheimer's drugs. Yeah, so just getting back to the, the a diet change and for Alzheimer's and, and looking at progression and the mechanism that I think at play, insulin resistance, you would expect some sort of change even in those biomarkers if you're helping with insulin resistance. I'm afraid that what I've learned is that for Alzheimer's, the progress starts 20 years before the clinical symptom. So that 
you, if you're getting an idea that you have insulin resistance, make a change now. I mean, especially if you have Alzheimer's in your family, if you have dementia in your family history, you want to take careful note. And insulin resistance, I think, is the mechanism, not the, not the cholesterol. That's the narrative that we've heard for so long. Of course, that might be true too. But insulin resistance is a is a more powerful sort of mechanism, in my opinion, in the clinical studies that have been done. So take take advantage of what we know about reducing insulin resistance by whatever means. Of course, I prefer dietary means over medications, but some doctors, all they know is medications. Which may not even work at all. All you may get for your $56,000 is a one in three chance of swelling or bleeding in your brain. When the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved the drug anyway, the head of the American Geriatric Society replied, my head just exploded. The bottom line is that there's only one diet that's ever been shown to help reverse our leading cause of death, heart disease, in the majority of patients, a plant-based diet. If that's all a plant-based diet can do, reverse the number one killer of men and women, then shouldn't that be the default diet until proven otherwise? And the fact that can also be so effective in preventing, arresting, or reversing the progression of other leading killers, like high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes, and now maybe even early-stage Alzheimer's disease, would seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming. <laughs> well, it's not the only diet that's effective, and yet, so you can assume a promoter, an advocate is going to say that sort of thing. Until that diet has been studied against every other diet, we don't know for sure. You can say you have the fastest car, but if you haven't studied, haven't tested your car against every other car, and there's no, no way to do that, then you, know, you really don't know if you have the best, fastest car. So uh, interesting video that I, I think, again, lifestyle is really important. There's not just one lifestyle that can be helpful. And it's great to see that the studies are being done on lifestyle with diseases like Alzheimer's. It's sort of the uh, next introduction or next level of research that needs to be done. In the keto world, there is research now by brain scientists looking at neuro, neurodegenerative disease. And in a textbook called Ketogenic, the science behind therapeutic carbohydrate restriction that came out last fall in 2023, fall of 2023, there are chapters on keto diets and neurodegenerative disease, including Alzheimer's. And it's not to the level of clinical trials like this, but I suspect with what they're seeing in the laboratory and in vitro that those studies will be coming at some point. So we'll watch out for those. I hope that's helpful. If you like, please like, subscribe, ring the notification bell, and I'm putting out new information on Wednesdays and Fridays. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and check out adapterlifeacademy.com.